Digital systems often need to store large amounts of data. There are different ways that this can be done. Perhaps the most obvious way if you've taken a basic digital logic course is to make use of a flip-flop or what's also known as a register. And while if you're storing a relatively small amount of data, this works just fine. If you end up wanting to store or needing to store large amounts of data, this ends up being not the most efficient approach. So this figure here shows an implementation of a D flip-flop with set and reset inputs. And this has 6.3 input NAND gates. And depending on exactly how this was implemented, it would take up to maybe 36 transistors. And there are more efficient ways that might be down to 20. But in any case, this is taking on the order of 20 to maybe 36 transistors. Maybe that doesn't seem like a lot for just one, but if you're trying to store thousands or millions or even possibly billions of bits of information, this quickly starts to add up. And so for large amounts of data storage, flip-flops or registers can be relatively large and expensive. And so we really want a different approach. And this different approach is generically referred to as a memory array. And basically a memory array can provide efficient storage as well as access to large amounts of data. And this is not to say that flip-flops and registers go away. There are still cases when we want these, but if we're storing large amounts of data, then they tend to, that tends to be done in a memory array. A memory array itself is generally structured as a, an array of 2 to the n m-bit pieces of data. This structure is basically broken down into where you have 2 to the n rows, and each one of those rows has m columns or n bits within it. Oftentimes, we may mention the depth of the array, which refers to the number of rows in the array, which could also be thought of as the number of words or the number of entries that are stored in the memory array. Similarly, the width refers to the number of columns or the number of bits that is stored in an individual row or an individual word or entry. And so the width is also the size of the word or entry in the array. And then with these two things combined, we can say that the total size of the array or the total number of bits stored in the array is 2 to the n time m bits. And so you might wonder, why are we saying 2 to the n rows as opposed to just n rows? And the reason for this is it allows us to easily describe how many bits we need to access the different rows in an array. So with 2 to the n different rows, we need a total of n bits to address the specific entries or the specific uh, rows that we have within the array. And so as an example of what a memory array could look like or an abstract memory array could look like, we're going to look at an example where we have two to the two or four rows, and each row is going to have five bits of information. And so this figure here is showing abstractly what the memory array could look like. So we've got a total of four rows. Each of those rows has got an address associated with it that allows us to identify which row we're trying to access or which entry we're trying to access. And then within each of these rows, we have five bits of data. And each of these rows can store different bits of data. And so going back to some of our terminology, the width of the array is the number of columns in the array. And the depth is the number of rows or the number of entries. As an, as an example of accessing something, if we were to look at the address binary 1, 0, we'd be looking at this address here. And we could see that the data stored at this entry is 11010. And so this is abstractly what a memory array looks like. When it actually comes to implementation in digital hardware, we need a little bit more. This figure here shows the general structure of a memory array. We still have our n bit address going in, and we have our m bits, in this case, three bits of data coming out. To select one of the rows in this array, we take the n bit address and feed it into a decoder. That decoder will activate one of the entries within the array. And what is activated is the referred to as the word line. So this is the horizontal line that activates a single row. When a row has been activated, we want to be able to read out or possibly write in new data. And to do that, we have bit lines which access the individual columns. And so the bit line is the vertical line that communicates the particular bit associated with the active word line 
out of the array or alternatively takes the data feeding in and stores it in the particular bit or particular column. And then finally, to store the data, we have some piece of hardware referred to as a bit cell that stores the value corresponding to the address identified by the crossing word and bit lines. Along with this, how the data is stored determines what type of memory that we're dealing with or what type of specific memory that we have. Along with storing this information, the storage approach determines the type of memory. And so to look, talk a little bit more about how the data is accessed and what it looks like when we have word lines accessing a particular bits. Here we're showing single bit cells and the different combinations of what the word line could be. And so first off, the word line, as we said before, allows a single row to be read or written. Essentially, it enables a particular row. And so we only have a single row or a single word line active at any time. And then this word line corresponds to a unique address in the memory array. And so as an example of how the word line affects accessing the particular stored bits, if on the, we look at the left here where we have the word line as one, meaning that we've activated a particular row of the memory array, then when that's one, we look at what is in the stored bit cell and that's what appears on the bit line. So in this top case, since the stored bit is zero, the bit line is going to output a, or going to contain a zero. And in the second case, it's stored bit is one, so the bit line is going to contain a one. If we look in the case on the right, the word line is zero, meaning we're not activating that line. And so that means we're not connecting the word line to the bit line. So in this case, we actually don't care what's in the stored bit cell because the column is not based off of what's in the bit cell. And so in this case, for this word line only, we basically have a high impedance state here because this particular word line is not driving the bit line. Some other active word line might, however, be driving this bit line. And so this provides a general introduction to the basics of memory arrays. And then the specifics of different types of memory depend really on the nature of how the information is stored in the bit cell.